Good morning. Welcome back to the eShikshana program uh, for the fifth session on uh, electrical power quality. So this is Pr Professor Umar Rao from RV College of Engineering, Bengaluru, bringing you the lectures in the course on electrical power quality with the code 18E, 825. So in uh, this session, we will see what are long duration disturbances, what is a sag, a swell, an interruption, and what are CBE may curve and ITC curve. So these four topics will be dealt with in the current session. So in the previous session, we saw some aspects of um, the classification of different power quality disturbances. And uh, we saw how transients are uh, described. So you had uh, impulsive transients and oscillatory transients. Uh, we saw the reasons for the transients. And um, so we will move on from there and see uh, another two, three types of important voltage uh, power quality disturbances um, in this session. So first of all, I have long duration and short duration voltage variation. So what do I mean by long duration? And what do I mean by short duration? So if any disturbance lasts for more than one minute, it's called as a long duration variation. So it lasts for more than one minute. So when we discussed the classification, we saw there are so many uh, you know, phenomena which last in milliseconds, microseconds, less than one minute. So these all fall under short duration um, uh, disturbances. And the ANSI C84.1 specifies what is the tolerance we expect from a power system. So in my first class only, I told you that though I define power quality deviation as a deviation in the voltage, shape, or frequency, etc., the utility cannot guarantee me that all the time. It's impossible because the power system is very dynamic. So the utility cannot tell an industry, for example, that I will give you 66 kV all the time. Or as an end consumer, I cannot expect my voltage to be exactly 231 volts, 50 hertz all the time. Since the system is dynamic, there will always be changes in the voltage. So the utility gives you, based on some standards, they give you the tolerance. What the utility will tell you is, look, I will give you, we'll see what the definitions are. I will see how, what are the tolerance levels. It will tell you, I will give you the voltage between plus or minus X percent from the nominal. So if your utility supplies you voltage in that bracket with that tolerance, then the utility is not at fault. But we saw some equipment which are very sensitive. So they cannot afford those deviations. Then the utility cannot help the customer. The utility cannot help the customer. The customer has to invest on a high quality source, like maybe put a very high quality uh, uninterruptible power supply, that is a UPS, or have its own uh, supply source. Here, and if the variation lasts less than one minute, we qualify it as a short duration voltage variation. Now, we have, this is again, uh, as described by ANSI-C84.1, uh, uh, they define two voltages, they define two voltages, and uh, this applies for a 120 volt system because uh, it is in the US. Anyway, it will give you an idea. It will uh, uh, give you an idea. So the utilization voltage, the utilization voltage is somewhere between one, uh, 125 to uh, uh, 108, 110. And then we have a shaded portion, A, and uh, uh, you know we have B. So A, the ranges where we are marked A, the shaded portions do not apply to circuit supplying lighting load. 
and the shaded portion of the range that is B does not apply to 120 volts to 600 volts system. It doesn't apply to those systems. So A is the optimal range. B is acceptable, but not optimal. Clear? A is optimal. Perfect. Pakka. So we have the utilization voltage. And then we have the service voltage, what can be guaranteed. And then uh, you have the service voltages for systems where your input is more than 600 volts. So these are for normal equipment operating at normal voltage of 120 volts. So you see the standard does not guarantee you 120 volts all the time. It allows the utility to permit it to go up to 128 or 108. So these are the deviations permitted. Now we'll see exactly what it is in the coming um, slides, okay? So and C C eighty four one for the service voltage limits. So for range A, the minimum voltage is ninety five percent and the maximum voltage is hundred and five percent. That means plus or minus five percent. So what I have shown you the values are in a voltage voltage of one twenty volts. If if the voltage is different, you have to suitably multiply it, scale it up. And range B, as I told you, A is optimal. B is acceptable but not optimal, is between 91.7 to 105.8. That means a larger deviation is okay. I can accept it. Okay. This is at the service, at the customer's premise. Service voltage means at the customer's premise. Okay. So range B allows a slightly uh, bigger deviation. It is acceptable, but not optimal. Then you have utilization voltage limit means on the utility side, which is further upstream. The customer is the last end point. So utility voltage level is above the customer voltage level. So obviously larger deviations are possible per meter. So for range A, optimal, it's between 90 to 104.2%. And for range B, 86.7 to 105.8%. These are the NCC 84 uh, standards defined. The occurrence of service voltages outside the range A limits should be infrequent. So most of the time, most of the time, the utility should operate in range A. That means the optimal range. But Sometimes it can go to range B, which is acceptable. Range A must be the basis for the utilization equipment's design and rating in order to give satisfactory performance. So your immunity, immunity which the manufacturer guarantees is for range A uh, voltages. Range B necessarily results from the practical design and operating conditions on supply or user equipment, which are part of practical operations. So, you know, we, because when we design, we make some assumptions or we do, we choose some standard values. So for example, if you're cap some capacitor compensation you have, and then the compensation uh, works out to, to be, uh, you know, some 35.2 microfarad. You might not have 35.2 microfarad. You might, the standard capacitor available may be only 35. So just for one customer, nobody is going to manufacture a 35.2 microfarad. So those sort of design deviations will always be uh, present. And that is why we have a range B. Okay. However, such conditions should be limited in extent, duration, and frequency. Extent means uh, how much of deviation is there for how long it does it last and how frequently does it go from range A to range B. Corrective measures should be undertaken to quickly bring back the voltages within range A if it goes into range B. Okay, so these are all uh, taken uh, the, from the reference which I have uh, uh, quoted here by uh, Cusco and Thompson, published by uh, McGraw-Hill. Okay, so we saw how the specifications are. Now let's get back to what is actually the specification. So long duration over voltages, 
are either over voltage or under voltage. Sorry, long duration variations are either over voltage or under voltage. Clear? And over voltages and under voltages generally they are not the result of system faults, but are caused by load variations on the system and system switching operations. What this means is this. See, when you have a fault, when you have a fault, you would clear it, right? So it will get quickly cleared. But an over voltage or an under voltage lasts for more than a minute. So it is not because of a fault, because a fault would have got cleared. It is mostly because of improper loading conditions and some switching on configurations like reorganization, you know, taking out a line and bringing in another line and so on. So to know whether there is an over voltage or uh, under voltage, we talk of RMS values. If there is, if you're at the customer terminal, if the voltage is 220 volts for more than one minute, it's an under voltage condition. If it's 250 volts or something for more than a minute, it's over voltage condition. We'll still, we have not still spoken of the thresholds. We'll talk about it. So basically here, we are talking of the RMS values to define the over voltage or under voltage condition. So first let us define the over voltage as defined by IEEE is an increase in the AC voltage RMS value typically to 110 to 120% of nominal. That is 1.1 to 1.2 percent of nominal at the power frequency for deviations longer than one minute. So remember what this means is up to 110% of the nominal, it's not considered as over voltage. So don't be under the impression that any voltage greater than nominal is over voltage. No, only above 110%, that is 10% more than the nominal, only then it qualifies to be called as an over voltage, right? So I have quantified it. So that is between 110 to 120%, 1.1 1 .1 to 1 1.2 per unit. It is at power frequency and the duration is quantified and it, ha it has to be greater than one minute. So why does this occur? It can occur on the high distribution voltage, higher side, that is 66 kV, 132 kV, because of an in, improper tap setting on transformers. So you know that the tra transformers have taps. So I might not have set it properly. So I may be getting a over voltage. I might have set it to a higher tap. I may be getting, a, getting that. And in my previous lecture, I told you under light load conditions, when the load is low, voltage can go up because the drop is less, current is less, drop is less. So receiving end voltage can go up because I have put on capacitors. See, in, in the afternoon, the load is very high. So the system is drawing a lot of lagging current. The load is drawing a lot of lagging current. So I have switched on capacitors to compensate for that. And I've left it on. Suddenly in the night, the load reduces. Industries are turned off, people turn off uh, their fans, etc. And the load, load is less, current has dropped, but my capacitors are still on, so my voltage will shoot up. You would have studied in transmission, this is called a Sperante effect, where the receiving end voltage can sometimes become higher than the sending end voltage because of the line capacitances. Okay, so in such cases, you might have an over voltage. So these occur mainly because either the voltage controls are inadequate or the system is too weak for voltage regulation when you energize many capacitors. So what can happen because of this? So you see here what I've done. I've plotted, you can see the voltage goes above the nominal and it lasts for some time. So if you take the RMS value, the RMS value should be greater than 110%. That is an over voltage. So the effect is equipment failure. Obviously, because of overheating, the voltage goes up. And um, electronics equipment can fail permanently. They may burn out if you have an over voltage. Or some equipment can shut down. A process industry itself can uh, shut down because of higher uh, voltages. And this will reduce the life expectancy of the equipment. So the equipment will have a shorter life. 
especially two for electronic devices, which run hotter when the voltage is high and fail prematurely. Clear? So whenever you see an electronic component burning, first look whether there is an over voltage. That is one of the main reasons. Right. Also, over voltage protection leads to equipment shutdown. You remember we have relays. We have over voltage relays. So we have set a threshold. So they will operate and they will shut down equipment. A PCB also will have a shorter life if it's uh, operated at a greater uh, voltage than what it is rated. So you see, there are a number of problems if you like the over voltage versus for a longer time, especially the most sensitive or your electronic equipment, including your digital electronic equipment. So how can you mitigate it? Mitigate means what is the solution for an over voltage? One is adjust the transformers to the correct tap setting. So adjust the transformers to the correct tap setting. If you have manual transformers, if you have automatic transformers, then it can be done automatically. Or you include, introduce automatic onload tap changes, which will automatically, if there's an over voltage, it will automatically reduce the tap. So this can improve the voltage profile. Okay. Then you can have voltage regulators, again, which use for tap switching. They're mechanical devices. Tap switching of the transformers without a manual uh, intervention. And you can also have uh, electronic tap switching voltage regulators. The second solution is switch off capacitor banks. One of another, as, as I discussed, one of the major reason, reasons are the presence of capacitor banks. So switch it off when the light is low. So when the load is light, okay, light load condition, switch off the capacitor banks. You may need to introduce induct inductors also, reactors, to bring down the voltage from the high voltage position. So these are the two common mitigating uh, solutions for this. So the synopsis of your over voltages, this synopsis means the summary. The magnitude is typically between 1.1 to 1.2 per unit. And the source can be the utility or the facility. Duration is more than one minute. And the symptoms, how do you know an over voltage occurs? Failure of equipment, malfunctioning. Okay. Occurrences medium to high, they occur quite often in the system. Under voltage reverse. So the IEEE 1159 standard differs under voltage as a decrease in the RMS value between 80 to 90 percent. So any voltage between 0.8 per unit to 0.9 per unit is called as an under voltage. Persisting for more than one minute. It should continue for more than one minute. It generally occurs on the low voltage distribution side because of heavily loaded distribution systems. Heavy loading, you can have, a, have an under voltage. Because when the system is heavily loaded on the distribution side, it draws a lot of current and uh, the distribution feeders will experience a larger drop and the voltages will sag. So, or you may have a capacitor and capacitor may switch off. So that can also cause it. So these are all reasons for uh, uh, under voltage. And uh, rem I, I remember I told you capacitors are turned on to improve the voltage profile. So when you switch off a capacitor, the voltage will drop. As I told you, morning their light load condition, you might have switched off the capacitor. And then slowly the load picks up. The capacitors are not switched on. Then it will result in an under voltage condition. So here you see the magnitude is less than the nominal. And we talk of under voltage in terms of the RMS values. These are all steady state phenomena. You don't talk in terms of amplitude, talk in terms of RMS. Right? So under voltage can expose electrical devices to problems such as overheating because if you if it's a constant power load, it may draw more current to get give the same power, right? Because P is equal to is proportional to Vi. So if voltage falls to maintain P, the current drawn will be more. So the equipment may get overheated. Again, you may have a malfunctioning, a premature, or shutting down of motors because of under voltage uh, conditions. So on. So common symptoms of under voltage includes motor run hotter than normal, 
they fail prematurely incandescent bulbs typically will tell you they will dim fluorescent bulbs may not come on only but incandescent bulbs will glow because it's only resistive but it will be dim right so if you take a distribution you know your voltage may drop like this right so here i may have some capacitor banks so again the voltage will go up again it may fall in the line so under voltage will result you know just see here under voltage so under voltages drop over voltages rise always remember whenever there's a voltage rise switch on reactor whenever there is a voltage drop switch on capacitor so how do i reduce under voltage so under voltage is predominantly caused because of drops because of drops so you reduce the system impedance so here in this figure if you see the voltage drops how do how can i reduce this drop how can i reduce this drop because this drop you don't see this is the this horizontal line is the nominal value at the substation i'm i'm boosting it by putting capacitors however as it goes through the line the voltage drops and at long distances the voltage it results in an under voltage it results in an under voltage so what i do i reduce the system impedance so the drop is reduced you can increase the size size of the transformer reduce the line length and then you can add capacitors series capacitors or increase the line conductors they are all expensive solutions all these coated solutions cost money next again you can have automatic tap changing whenever there is an under voltage it will increase the tap but i have a limit i don't have taps with large taps so maximum you will have around 10 to 12 taps so each tap around 2% you can increase so you have a limited control with tap changing but still automatic on load tap changers are one solution to mitigate both over voltage and under voltage right reduce the line current so do some load shedding supposing there's a severe under voltage some load shedding may have to be done or maybe you transfer the load from one feeder to another feeder because as i told you this under voltage is normally felt at the distribution level consumer level at your at your at the consumer level so you try to shift load from one feeder to the other feeder so that the voltage at this uh, feeder uh, recovers or today we have compensators you can put uh, distribution stat coms or static work compensators etc these are all some of the problems so the synopsis of an under voltage uh, condition is the magnitude is typically between 0.8 to 0.9 per unit and it lasts for more than 1 minute and this also occurrence is medium to high this also occurs pretty often then you have sustained interruption interruption means voltage falls to zero or close to zero very close to zero for more than 1 minute for more than 1 minute because all long duration it has to be more than 1 minute okay sustained interruptions are often permanent in nature and require manual intervention it might be because of a fault a tree might have fallen and cut off a line because of which the consumer is not getting uh, uh, power so these are all some reasons and they may require it may not be possible to completely automate the entire sustained uh, uh, interruption uh, mitigation so some power system phenomenon also uh, you know can result in a sustained interruption okay outage when we talk of a power outage you talk of a state of a system component which has failed to function line outage line outage means that line is not operating it need not be literally out of the circuit it is not operating as intended it is removed from service okay so in the concept of power quality monitoring interruption has no relation to reliability or other continuity of service statistics so don't confuse reliability here we are not talking of reliability right sustained interruption is simply for whatever reason the voltage almost comes to zero for more than 1 minute so it affects all facilities we have discussed at length how the process industry is so dependent on power and any failure can lead to huge downtime costs 
and communication and information businesses will be significantly disturbed. So I have told you your banking sector, airline reservation, stock markets, all these and semiconductor manufacturing industries, these are all some of the most affected ones. So interruption, how do you prevent and protect? So you can reduce incidence of system faults like include arresters and typically inspect your feeders, inspect your feeders, do tree trimming, cut the trees so that short circuits are reduced. Animal guards, sometimes animals enter and disrupt, they cause havoc, okay? So all these are some ways by which you can reduce the interruption. And try to limit the number of users affected. So that, that is a question of planning. So if one line goes out, then the customers affected by that, of this, there's a problem of interruption, the customers affected should be localized, okay? So improve select, that's called a selectivity, locally. So the number of customers who are impacted should be reduced. So I improve the selectivity. And then fast reclosing, quickly reclose the circuit breakers. That is today very well done because we have very good uh, technology with so fast acting uh, uh, reclosing circuit breakers. So fast reclosing circuit breakers, what happens? They open in a fault and quickly reclose by then the fault might have cleared. For example, the lightning. The lightning may have cleared by itself. So you do a fast reclosing. And then I protect the end user. End user may put UPS. As I told you, if your equipment is very sensitive, then you have to provide a solution for yourself. So install some uh, UPFs or uh, some uh, voltage restorers, DVRs, they're called dynamic voltage restorers. So all these things are... Uh, mitigation solutions uh, for uh, interruptions. Now, so the long duration variations, voltage variations are over voltage between 110 to 120 percent, under voltage between 80 to 90 percent, and interruption where it is close to zero. And they're all more than one minute. They're all more than one minute. Now, short duration voltage variations. It's called as a voltage. The first one is a voltage sag or a dip. Sag is the word used in US. Dip is used by IEC. IEEE uses sag and dip. Uh, I, uh, IEC uses the word dip. Both mean the same. So the IEEE 1159 standard describes a sag as a decrease in the RMS voltage from 10 to 90%. 10 to 90%. Okay, that means from 0.1 per unit to 90, uh, 0.9 per unit, any voltage in between if you have, it's called as a sag. And there's one more standard, EN, European standard, EN 50160, 50160, which describes it as 1% to 90%. Okay, it is at power frequency, 50 hertz, lasting between one and a half cycle to one minute. So you just see here, the RMS value I have plotted, there is a dip and then it regains. So this, so in, if you look at the time plot here, you can see there is a sag. The word itself indicates sag, dip comes down. Sagging means coming down. The only thing is this duration is very small, less than one minute. Unlike an under voltage, which lasts for more than one minute. They're typically caused by weather. Weather can cause, which normally leads to system faults. If it's very hot, very hot, what happens? Uh, the voltage, the lines may sag, touch a tree, cause a short circuit, okay? Or when you, that, that will cause a single line to ground fault. It will cause a single line to ground fault. So if you have a single line to ground fault, it will cause a voltage and sag in one, one phase and it may cause an increase in the other two phases because it will not affect all of them uh, uh, equally. Or if you put on a heavy motor, Voltage will sag because the motor will draw a huge starting current. And because of this, the voltage can sag. So large motors, I told you yesterday, today the process industries use motors up to 5,000 HP, 10,000 HP. They can draw even 10 times the normal current. So it will immediately sag. And I, we, I, I discussed, we have all experienced this at our houses. If I switch on the motor pump for a moment, the voltage dips, I can easily feel it in the lighting. 
Okay, so these are all some of the reasons for voltage sag. So you see here, you have a nominal value, it falls down to around 80% and then slowly picks up. Slowly picks up. Now, this is a very interesting slide. You just see here what happens. Okay, how sag can percolate or how a fault somewhere else can affect another person, another uh, equipment, another customer. So here, just see here, I have three radial feeders, F1, F2, F3. Okay, uh, being fed from a 69 kV uh, bus with a transformer, 20 MVA transformer. So yeah. Now let's assume there is a fault, a short circuit in feeder to F2. F2, there is a short circuit. Clear? So what will happen when there is a short circuit for the duration of the short circuit? This voltage at this 12 kV bus will drop because the short circuit will draw huge current. So the voltage will drop. And to this 12 kV, I have connected a feeder F1 and a feeder F2 and F3. The fault is in F2. But both F1 and F3 are also connected to the same bus. So both F1 and F, F3 also, all the three buses, the voltage sags. Can you see this red line? The green line is the nominal value. The voltage sags. It has come down to around 0.7 per unit or something. It's come down. Then what happens? The relay will energize the breaker of F2 and F2 breakers will open. F2 breaker will open, right? So the feeder to voltage will come become zero because it's open, right? It, it is no longer connected to this bus. So if you, if you look at this black dotted line in the uh, below second figure, the voltage of feeder two will come to zero. And since the fault is isolated, F1 and F2 quickly, the voltage will go up. Clear? Voltage will go up. So F1 and F2 are recovered. But you can see that even though the fault is in F2, both F1 and F3 experience sags. Both F1 and F3 experience sags. Clear? Now what is happening at the next instant? I have, I have uh, marked here. Again, if you see this black dotted line, what happens? This breaker recloses. I have an automatic recloser. We just saw an no? automatic recloser. So there are two possibilities. First pos possibility is the fault has cleared. Okay. So what has happened? Fault occurs after a few uh, some cycles. The circuit breaker opens. So the voltage in F1 and F3 recovers after experiencing a uh, sag. Then after some time, the breaker of F2 closes, automatically closing. If the fault has cleared, anyway, F1 and F3 have recovered their voltage. F2 voltage also will recover and they'll all have this green line. But when this breaker closes, supposing the fault is not cleared, it is still existing. Then what will happen? Again, there will it will experience a sack. Again, it will experience a sag, right? And again, this breaker will open because the fault is still persisting. And again, F1 and F3 will recover and F2 voltage will come to zero. Normally, the breakers reclose twice. So after the second reclosure, if the fault has recovered, you see everything will come back. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is these sags percolate in the system. The effect is felt Okay, so you see here, this is my reference voltage. Then I need to know for how much duration it occurs. And then what is the drop? This is called as the depth of sag. Up to what level it drops? That's called as the depth of sag. And what is the voltage, remaining voltage? That is called as the residual voltage. So if it falls by 0.4 per unit, that is a voltage is 60%. So let us say I have one per unit. Okay. Next it is 0.6 per unit. Next the voltage is 0.6 per unit. So how do I specify? 
one per unit is the nominal voltage. 0.6 is the residual voltage. That means what is the voltage remaining after the sag? And 0.4 is the sag depth. So I have the nominal voltage minus the sag depth is the residual voltage. So how do I mitigate? Because this occurs. No? I have an industry, I have many drives. So all these drives, every time the drives are switched on, the voltage sags. So how do I uh, account for that? What do I do? Hmm? So first is incorporate voltage sag right through capability. That means you build it in the equipment. So equipment manufacturers have to uh, see that the equipment does not fail because the sag lasts for a short time. It should be a part of the design. And the companies procuring new equipment should establish a procedure that rates the importance of the equipment. If the equipment is expensive and very critical, then they must put a UPS for that equipment. See, all of us know that we, we normally earlier, we used to put a small UPS for our computers because I want to protect my computer. Clear? And uh, this is a part of the design and planning process and a part of the manufacturing process. So semiconductor industry says that the right through should be 50%. So right through means what? Your equipment should ride through the fault. That means it should not fail immediately. It should be capable of withstanding. It should have that immunity. I've used the word immunity earlier. So UPS is one obvious solution. Use an UPS. It's a solution for everything. If your equipment is sensitive, you install an UPS. So all of us know in all our colleges, etc., or even in industries, the computers have a UPS. They're always run through a UPS. We don't connect the computer directly to the system and have a backup power supply to support the load for a brief period. And utility can improve from their side the sags by cutting trees on time so that the sags do not occur and replace relays by fast acting relays so that faults, faults can be detected often quickly, more quickly and have all reclosing breakers. So these are all some measures the utility can take. The opposite of sag is swell, increase, okay? Analogous to over voltage. SAG is analogous to under voltage. The duration is different. So the IEEE 159, 1159 defines a swell as an increase in the RMS value from 110% to 180% of nominal. Clear? And duration is only half a cycle to one minute, not more than a minute. So again, here we have instantaneous, which lasts for 30 cycles. That is less than one second and momentary, which can go up to third, three seconds, and temporary between three seconds and one minute. We have discussed this even under classification. So the gravity of the power quality problem during a fault condition is a function of the system impedance, because that will affect how what is the drop, and then what is the zero sequence impedance, where the fault is located, how is the grounding, is the grounding <coughs> strong enough for the faults to have a path, etc. So if you have an ungrounded system, for example, a line to ground fault on the unfaulted phases can drive the voltage as much as 1.73 per unit during an SLG fault. On the other hand, if you have grounded it, then you will not have such a huge rise in the unfaulted systems. So in fact, EPRI has said that 80% of the power quality problems arise because of improper grounding. Grounding is one of the most important aspects to improve the power quality, proper grounding. So what are the causes for voltage swell? Mostly it is because of faults. And you see here how the swell is done. This is the RMS value. The RMS value goes up between half a cycle to one minute. So the faults, particularly in ungrounded systems or floating delta systems, they cause over voltages, swells, where the sudden change in ground reference can result and cause a voltage rise in the ungrounded system. And single line to ground faults are one of the most common causes of voltage swells. 
They can also be caused by de-energization of a very large load. Same thing. If you suddenly load, it causes a sag. If you suddenly remove a load, load, load rejection, it causes a swell. Right? So an abrupt de-energization can V is equal to L di by dt. Suddenly I make I zero by removing the load, the voltage can shoot up. Okay. Energization of a large capacitor bank can also cause a voltage swell. Effects, of course, equipment breakdown. And it may be sudden or it can be gradual. Suddenly it may break down or gradually it may go wear and tear and then suddenly it may break down one day. And it can cause uh, a lot of issues with your electronics equipment. They are more prone to damage, overheating, shutdown. So all these are some of the effects of voltage swell. Short duration interruption. Interruption, you know, when the voltage falls less than uh, close to zero. So the IEEE definition says it's less than 10% for less than one minute. So if it lasts for less than one second, it is instantaneous. Up to three seconds, it is momentary. And up to one minute, three seconds to one minute, it is temporary. This is mostly because of reclosing of circuit breakers. So, you know, it tries to reclose. Then the fault persists. Again, it will open, persists, close, open. So it is because of that. Okay. Aside from system faults, interruptions can also be caused due to control malfunctions and equipment failures. Let us say I have put a relay to protect a motor. The relay malfunctions. So the relay may trip the motor and the mo we can't say that. I mean, the interruption essentially is in power is interrupted. That's because the relay has isolated the motor from the supply. That's also an interruption of supply to the motor, but that's not caused because of the utility fault. It's caused because of the equipment failure. Okay. So short interruptions are similar to voltage sags. Same things happen. Equipment can be stopped like computers, programmable logic com uh, controllers, automatic speed drives, then unnecessary tripping of protective devices, simply it may trip, loss of data, malfunction of data processing equipment. So these are all some of the things which can occur because of uh, uh, voltage uh, sats. Lastly, we have something called power acceptability curves. So how do I know that the quality of power is acceptable to me? And this is generally defined by CBMA, that is the Computer Business Equipment Manufacturers and the Information Technology Industry Council. Because these are the most sensitive equipment. These are the most sensitive um, equipment, right? So the ac acceptance curve is given like this. Two boundaries are given, okay? So the y-axis is percentage change. So zero means your voltage is nominal, okay? Zero is voltage is nominal. That means zero deviation. Zero deviation means normal voltage. That is the y-axis is deviation. X-axis is time, but if you see, it has a logarithmic scale. So this is 0 0.301, 0 0.201, then 0 0.1 second, 1, 10, 100,000. So it's a logarithmic scale. Clear? So the left end shows for very short duration. And as you move towards the right after x-axis, longer duration. Now I draw two boundaries. One above the nominal and one below the nominal. Clear? So whatever is in between these two boundaries is acceptable. Now let's see how to interpret it. Supposing I take a point here. The deviation is 100, 100%. That means the voltage is 100% increased. But how small is it? 0. 0.0001 second. Three zeros one second. That is 0. 0.1 millisecond. 0.1 millisecond. It's acceptable. That means what? Deviation is large, but the time is very small, so it is acceptable. So it is acceptable. But come here, say one second, one second, then the deviation is very small. So if you want to, if you want the equipment to withstand for a larger deviation, larger duration, then the magnitude should be small. So what these boundaries tell you is, Larger magnitudes, the equipment can withstand for a shorter time, but shorter magnitudes, it can withstand for a longer time. Above the boundary, 
it's a over voltage condition below the boundary it's an under voltage condition it's an under voltage condition of course this is a sag or a swell because the duration is very small sag or swell clear so the itic curve is similar only thing is this is curved and this they have given in terms of uh, straight lines the meaning is the same so we have two boundaries one for over voltage condition and one for under voltage condition and anything which falls within the boundary is an acceptable deviation and anything which falls outside the boundary is a non acceptable deviation so uh, in this lecture uh, we discussed today the long duration and short duration voltage variations thank you